All right, everybody, we're going to kick this off. We're about to get started by our next panel that is sponsored by Google. Um, I'm going to be joined up here, and I'm happy to introduce uh, Valicia Butterfield-Jones, who's the VP of Diversity and Partnerships and Engagement at Google, and this man who needs no introduction, Dean Ice. Hey, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. What's going on? Okay, so she said it was a performance, but I think it's more like a conversation between just us friends. Would you agree? Yes, 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 yes. We've known each other for like how many, like Twenty, over two decades. Over two decades, yes. we've been real friends. And in today's conversation, um, I first just want to say it's an honor and truly a blessing to be sitting here in this space with each of you for what I believe to be um, such a time in our history. Um, so before we begin, I first want to just say happy birthday. Thank you. Let's give it up for Dee's birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, wait, we have one. Okay. Music now. Bye. Shout out to the happy sound guy. <laughs> okay. A little birthday song. That's birthday about. vibes. Um, also, happy Father's Day, yes, Dee, yes. and to all the fathers out there. Happy Father's Day, um, and happy Juneteenth. I think that's like the best part about my birthday, right? Is that I, sh you know, I'm fortunate enough to share it with such a legendary day for us people. So I was, I was born on June 19th at 11 11 a.m. So I was, I was supposed to do something great. <laughs> I was definitely supposed to do something great with my life. It's giving emancipation. Absolutely. It's giving liberation. Yes, yes, yes. all of those it's things. It's giving all the things. Um, and, and what a time it is to be here at Can Lions Festival celebrating the fifth anniversary of the Inkwell Beach stage. So let's yes. give it up for Inkwell. Yes. And so... We at Google wanted to have a conversation between us friends about, at this time, the role of music and technology at the intersection of disruption and owning our own narrative. And I think it's fitting, D, for the, us to be at the Inkwell Beach stage at Cannes for a powerful conversation about owning your narrative, especially at this time for each of us, both individually and collectively as a community. So D, first, how does it feel in this moment to be sitting here celebrated for not only a breakthrough that you had during the pandemic, but for a 30 year meteoric rise in the entertainment yes. industry. So one, I, I do want to shout out the Inkwell. Um, I vacation on Martha's Vineyard every year. So like I go to the Inkwell every year, like the Inkwell Inkwell. So like to have this here, you know, out here in Cannes is like amazing. Um, as far as how how does it feel, uh, I'll be honest with you. You know, like I've been in the music industry obviously for like over three decades as a recording artist, and then I started a creative services agency for ten years, and I left that and, and became a DJ. And you know, you could never prepare for like what happened during the pandemic. So I don't really celebrate it, what's happening in my life, because it it it. Even though the music and everything was pure, still it's like the way that that part of my life came was such a it was all it wasn't about me. It, it belongs to everyone, you know. So you know, I feel I feel good about it, but there are some times when it feels a bit heavy because I gotta when I when I see people out, everyone shares their 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 COVID stories with me and and I listen, but it's heavy. You know, when you hear people talking about, you know, they wanted to commit suicide, but then they found this community and they heard the music and they danced together. When you hear those stories, it's, it's, it's heavy. It's heartwarming, but it's definitely heavy. So there, there's sometimes I feel good about it. And then there's sometimes where I'm just like, I just flow with it, you know. Thank you for being honest about the heaviness of it, because I think for many of us, and if you agree, please let us know, but the pandemic was heavier than we thought. I think for years, we're gonna be unpacking the trauma, the sadness, the fear that so many of us felt with the unknown. I know I for sure you know, felt that. So how do you think you were able to connect 
on such a deep level during such a difficult time. And I say that because there were a lot of people spinning music on Instagram. There were a lot of great, amazing DJs who we know and love, like doing great things. But there is something about who, like what you brought into the space that was so different and so needed. Like we didn't know we needed it, but you were like a light in a sea of darkness. So how do you think, or why do you think you were able to connect on such a deep level? I think I was able to connect because I felt the same way that everyone else did. You know, like I moved to Los Angeles one year before the pandemic. I moved, which is so crazy. 2020 was technically supposed to be my last year of DJ and I didn't want to do it anymore. I was like, I'm over it. I remember I, that. Yeah, I was tired of fighting for position as you get older, ageism really exists. You know, like you start getting older in our entertainment industry and I was definitely tired of like fighting and I was like, all right, you know what? I had an opportunity to, to get into film and television production. So I moved to LA for that with no family there. So when the, when, when the pandemic happened, I was in LA by myself, you know? So I had no food. I didn't have, I literally had nothing. I'm not making this up. I went to the store, I went to Ralph's, I went to Whole Foods, people had broken into everything. I had no toilet paper, I had nothing. So the music wasn't just saving other people's lives, it was saving my own, you know, that's what kept me focused. So when you ask me why did it resonate, it resonated because I felt like everyone else. You know, every, every comment that people said, it, it, it's what I was feeling, you know, and when I was hungry, you know, people like Chris Spencer and his wife, they would send food and Ubers and, you know, so when I say it's about community, it really is about community. That's why I don't feel like I own anything. It's like we all did this together. I was just going to say, I think the community of it all um, really was just access, right? Um, Jonathan and my team and I joked earlier that like Club Quarantine was the first club that everyone could get in, right? Like there was no VIP. There was no cover <laughs> charge. You didn't need ID. <laughs> no ID. But you know what's so crazy? Like the, by day three, DJ Envy called me. And he said, he was like, yo, this is the first time in my life that I was ever able to dance with my family. Yes. You know, and like, I never, I never forgot that. With every song that I played, I always remembered what he said, which is why I never, I didn't play like too much explicit language. Like I tried to keep it as clean as possible because people were quarantined at home with their families, yeah. you know, like, and you wanted, I wanted to make sure that whatever I played was something that, everyone can dance to. So D is probably one of, if not the most kind people that I know. And anyone that knows them knows that it's very real, it's very genuine and very authentic. Um, but what I found during this experience that I witnessed you having was the art and the science of club quarantine, yes. right? So. D, you know, he's like, yeah, it felt good. It was authentic. And it was all of those things. You had everyone from First Lady Michelle Obama in the room to Joe Biden in the room to Halle Berry, you name it. But there was also a science, right? Like I yes. think about the business behind Club Quarantine that you built. I, I hope I'm not overstating this, but I believe at the point of breakthrough, you were on, in conversations with major companies yes. negotiating major deals. So can yes. you talk a little bit about the science of that? Well, the science of it was, was um, look, the, Michelle Obama didn't just happen to pop into my IG. You know, like, even when you saw the video of me, like, oh, Michelle Obama's in here. I wasn't nervous because she was in there. I was trying to remember the song that she loved. Shout out to Stephanie. Shout exactly. Out to Shout out to the crew, Ashley, Stephanie. Club quarantine happened because it, the, the real story of it is it's about being nice to people, being kind to people. You know, oh my gosh, you're here. The ink well, come on now. Ah, oh. yo, oh my gosh, I will be there this for two weeks, Martha's Vineyard. I can't wait to see you. Um, but the story really, the, the story actually started on Martha's Vineyard. I'm not lying, like walking down. I was walking down, I never really tell this publicly because this is part of like the book of like sharing the story on how this happened, how beautiful it yes, is. Yes, book. 
But like, yeah, walking, I was walking down Circuit Ave on Martha's Vineyard and a, and a gentleman stopped me and, you know, we talked. I never asked him what he did. You know, that's, you don't do that on Martha's Vineyard. You, you, you're there, you just talk, you share. My daughter Dylan was playing with his daughter and I just conversed with, with he and his wife. And that was like August of, 20, of 2019. And, you know, the following six months later or eight months later when the pandemic hit, three, day three of CQ, he called me and was like, hey, when we met, I didn't tell you I worked at Instagram. So my, my thing is, like, just imagine had I been rude to that guy. You know what I mean? Like, while we were out there on the island, I, while we were on the vineyard, rather, had I not been kind to him, then none of this happens. You know what I mean? Like, being able to, I actually called and asked Michelle Obama to uh, come on my IG Live. But that happens because I had the relationship with them because I would always DJ for them. You know, Valicia was part of the reason why I was able to DJ for a lot of these candidates, you know, and I've, I've done a lot of work with them, you know, from being surrogates to playing parties. And, and, you know, had I not been kind to them, then none of this happens. Then the world is different, you know. What's up, Aaron? What up? They got the whole MV crew in here. <laughs> but no, seriously, it's, it's really about being kind to people. It's, it's so interesting, too, because I just look around the room and I see so many influential people. I see Tiffany R. Warren. I see Londell McMillan. I see Jason Lee. I see Adonis Spicer. I see so many decision makers, really everyone in this room. And I think about, to your point, the spaces I've been blessed to be in. And it's like working for President Obama, working for the Grammys, working for Google Now. And I really feel like it's our responsibility when we, we occupy these spaces to open the door for a talent that is deserving, right? So when you say that I helped connect those dots, it was really because it's like preparation meets opportunity. Yes. Like you'd been killing it for years and it was just, you know, I was now in a space to create better access. And so it's something I take seriously and you know that. Yes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about pivoting. Um, I remember when we first met, I was a law student at North Carolina Central University School of Law. Do you remember this? I definitely remember that. Straight out of Wilson, North Carolina. I'm a country girl. Um, so being here is wild, by the way. And then Dee was world-renowned rapper deciding what you were going to do next. Let's talk about it. So for me in my rap career, I started in um, 2000, oh, not even 2000, I'm over here giving you like my, my 90s, DJ career. 90s. I started in 1986 um, with a group called Boogie Down Productions. I was just a baby. BDP, I was, you said you were a baby, yes. I was 15 years old. By the time I was 22 years old, I was considered old school, you know, and I had to figure out what was next, you know. You know, when the, when the clapping, when, no, when the applause stop, like, what do you do? And that was a very, that was a difficult time for me. You know, like, I, I lost everything. I, and what's so crazy is I was just in Queens um, last week. Last week I played the Apollo um, Spring Gala, and I went to my old neighborhood, and I, I was showing my friends. I was like, man, I remember when, you know, in the early 90s when I lost everything, and I would get, like, my royalty checks, I didn't have a bank account. I would go over to the check cash in place to, to cash the check, you know, like I was trying to figure life out, you know, no one, we weren't really prepared for that, you know, so the pivot has always been real to me, you know, I've always been honest and I share with people. I've had, my, my story is amazing, you know, I, you know, coming into this business at 16 and I learned how to produce records and I learned how to write and you know, write for other artists and produce for other artists. And then when I lost everything, what really saved my life was technology. I started producing websites. Like, people didn't even know it. Like, the first Alicia Keys site, Diary of Alicia Keys, I built that. I coded that myself. You know, like, people don't even know. Like, Alicia will tell you, uh, you know, I had to convince her to, like, have a diary online for people to go back. And she was like, no, nobody's ever going to go back to this. And then one day we were at a party together around, maybe this was about six or seven years ago, and she, was, she said to me, she was like, you know we pretty much created Twitter, right? 
I was like, yeah, like nobody was doing that, you know, when 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 that album was out. But I, I, I mean, I did everyone's sight from I, Reebok to Luther Vandross when he was alive, Annie Lennox, every artist side I was building, you know, but no one knew it. But and and thank God that you know, to me, creativity doesn't just stop with like music. You know, I've always felt like if I'm able to make a record, then I should be able to take a picture, or I should be able to build a website, or I should be able to build whatever, and and that that pivot has always been real to me. I remember that um, D was not only a computer programmer who would spend hours and hours and days and nights and wouldn't sleep until you like built that site yep. for major brands, but also photography. Aaliyah, also photography. the late Aaliyah. Do you want to talk Got a little my bit camera about that? With me. I shot a lot of campaigns. I did some Aaliyah work, um, but with Aaliyah, I actually built the last Aaliyah website and the, the website for Black Round Records. Um, as a photographer, I shot campaigns for Grey Goose to Nike. The crazy thing about the Nike campaign, though, Nike asked me, um, the execs at Nike asked me to go out and shoot like these basketball courts in New York City, like all of the legendary basketball courts. And I went out, I photographed them, but I was I was smart enough to retain the rights to all of my images, you know, because I, I, I just felt like, yo, uh, uh, Getty Images started somehow, you know what I mean? Like it had to be someone's vision, so I was smart enough to retain my images. And the crazy thing happened was like, um, NBA All-Star ended up in New York City the year after I shot it, and then they had to license those images again. And so I just learned early on about the, the power of like ownership and, and just branding yourself that way. So you're talking about the power of ownership, um, and it reminds me of a conversation that I had the other day with a good friend who's also here, another legend in the room, Brandon Marshall. Mm -hmm. And the power of the pivot from sports as an example to building a multimedia platform, or many of us here who have transitioned and had several chapters or lives within this one journey. So let's talk a little bit about the hardship, right? Like I think we talk a lot about the pivot and it sounds sexy, right? Like, oh, I was a DJ, oh, okay, I, w I built you know, websites, but not enough about the struggle in the pivot. So can you break down for a second what in those moments, like the fear, the hurt, the pain, whatever it was, actually motivated you instead of like breaking you down? Or did it do both? I don't, I don't want to say that it was fear involved in it at all. Like I don't, it goes back to like the way that I grew up. You know, I didn't grow up in a household with my parents. You know, like I was talking to my daughter the other day. My daughter is, is She's uh, 27, and she's one of my attorneys now. And Shout out to Ashley. Yeah, so I didn't grow up the way that she did. You know, I grew up like a little kid. I was a latchkey kid. I was on, like, buses at seven years old going to school, coming home, and I had to be at home, like, before the, before the sun was down, you know, before sunset. Like, I can't even imagine. I have an 11-year-old daughter. I can't imagine her being outside doing the stuff that I was doing when I was seven, eight years old. But... It truly built character, though, for me during that time, you know. So I, I never really, I don't have a fear of anything. Like no one ever, no one ever told me to not climb that tree. I climbed the tree and I fell, cracked over my head, you know. But I was good though. I was like, yo, I, I knew not to climb it that same way the next time, you know. So um, I don't, I don't really have a fear when it comes to anything. Like I just believe, like this is my life. I got one life. It's all I know about, and I want to I wanna make the best of it. I want to do as much as possible. I want to have that experience, but also I want to be able to share that experience with other people to, in, to inspire them to do great things. Now, to go back to your question about the hardship, absolutely, it was hard. I can't lie. You know, there were, there were times when I, like, I risked it all, and I lost everything. I had to start all over. As a matter of fact, going from web development to DJing, wasn't wasn't easy because as a DJ, no one wanted to hire me, but I just, I felt like that's where I wanted to be. At the time, I was still running my web development company, but I was so passionate about the music 
that I, I just let it all go. I was like, no, I need to do music. There's something that's, that's drawing me to music. And I went, in, I went into debt. I had to figure this out. If I want to do music, I'm going to be dedicated to it. And thank God that I did. You know, there's no CQ without. And, and by the way, I will say this. Look, Club Quarantine, the, the idea of this virtual party, look, has it changed my life? Absolutely. I'm not going to sit here and lie. But it changed my life for, in, in a very good way. It was the first time in my entire career that I felt like I can authentically be myself. Like, I wanted to do good things for people. You know, when people, when CQ started, I had deals on the table that was well over three or four million dollars in the first week, and I took no one's money. Not that I didn't need the money. I just didn't want the money that way. I wanted to play the music for people, you know? So, like, that's what my life has been about. Like, what am I gonna do for people? And if I win, cool. We win together, but at the end of the day, my conscience is clear, and I'm happy with everything that I've done. All money ain't good money, right? Nope. Um, can I ask you anything? Anything. All right, y'all, buckle up. Let's Let talk about love. Um, not necessarily your love life, but for many of us, and if you can relate, let me know, when you operate from a place of like real purpose, real intention, right? Like many of us are just that A type, go hard, all the way, I'm gonna run into a wall for my dreams, right? Who can relate? That comes with a cost. Yeah. Sometimes it is misunderstood. Sometimes it requires a lot of hard decisions. Am I gonna take this trip or spend time with my loved ones? And sometimes it, that light can be so bright because I would imagine that we in this room know our purpose. We know what we want to do. We've set our North Star. And that's hard for maybe family or partners who haven't found their own. So how have you navigated love or even loss personally as you've navigated this like extremely successful career? There there were two things that happened in in my career where I just lost the feeling for like romance. Not that I'm, you know, I didn't believe in it, but it was I I I, I can specific I can point out those two things. One was when my music career was over. I remember walking down the street and this this little kid was like, everybody was like, yo, that's D nice. He's like, man, that's not D-Nice. D-Nice always had his hair cut. But I had lost all my money, so I couldn't afford a haircut. So I ended up going to buy some clippers, and then I shaved my head bald before I was actually bald. You know, like now I don't really, my hair doesn't grow the same way. But that was a real moment for me, though. Like that was a, that was a tough moment of like, of what fame can do. You can have fame and, and you know, you, you can try to still feel hot, but there's someone out in the streets that'll remind you like, yo, you're not hot right now. I never wanted to feel that again. Yeah. I was like, I never wanted my, whatever it was that I was gonna do, wasn't gonna be based on someone telling me who I am. I, I needed to know who I am. You know, and that, that, was, a, that was a serious moment for me. Um, being, being in a, relationships were extremely tough for me because there's nothing that I wanted more than to be successful. You know, like I wanted that, like, and I sacrificed everything that I, because of that. And when you think about club quarantine, I'm only using that because that's the latest thing that happened. But the part that hurt the most for me when I was sitting at home, when the world stopped, which is crazy because I did not want romance because I was like, no, I'm doing this. I can deal with that later. But when the world stopped, and I was sitting in that apartment in downtown Los Angeles and I was by myself. That was the loneliest that I've ever felt in my life. Like, so a lot of this happened because I was feeling that way. Do I want to feel that way now? Absolutely not. I believe that you, you should be able to share all of these incredible things in your life with a partner or with your family. 
but I just didn't know that, you know, growing up, I didn't recognize that. I just wanted what I wanted, you know. I just wanted to not just be successful. I just wanted to get out and do whatever it was that I loved. So thinking about how to diversify, you know, your business or your portfolio, I think about, you know, how you just seem to keep driving new streams of revenue um, during such an exciting moment. So can you talk about the importance of that? I think about all the time, right? So many of us have a great career, great job, but tomorrow, right? Someone could decide that it's over, right? Or some of us who are entrepreneurs and founders, you know, the clients could dry up. The funding could dry up. So, uh, so I'm just curious to know how important it is for you to have multiple streams of revenue, how I, can, I watch you continue to diversify and expand your business, and why is that important to you to do right now? So part of it happened, a lot of the things that I've experienced happened before the quarantine, obviously. You know, um, about seven or eight years ago, I sat down with a gentleman named Troy Carter, used to manage Lady Gaga, and Troy's a big investor, invested in Uber, invested in all of these things. And, you know, I was thinking about, like, yo, you know, you know, I wasn't making the amount of money that Troy did, but I wanted to do something with what I had. And, I, you know, I called him, and once again, just being kind to people, Troy, Troy was like, bro, you're D-nice, come to my office, let's talk. And I sat down with Troy, and it was the first time like, I didn't grow up knowing anything about investing. Like that wasn't what was taught to me, you know. Like, like I said, I've been on my own since I was 16 years old, so investing was not one of those things that anyone ever brought up to me. So it was, it was pretty foreign to me. But when I sat down with Troy in his office, and you know, he showed me everything. Like, yo, I, he had this whole incubator room with all of these people that were developing these apps, and I was like, man, this is crazy. So I, I had some money saved, and instead of buying new cars and a bunch of jewelry, I was like, yo, I'm going to invest this. You know, had I not invested, I probably would have been hurt during, during COVID. You know, like the investments actually kept me going, you know, where I didn't have to put a cash up up. I didn't have to ask anybody for anything. Yeah, because I had invested, you know. And I, I talk about this all the time on my Instagram. I tell people... You know, I probably overshare because I'm like, look, I just invested in this. Like, yo, you should get involved. Like, you know, I'm in, I'm in everything. You know, from from apps to Stripe to, you know, I'm in a cognac now, which is so crazy. Which, you know, like, I used to be an ambassador for a cognac, and like now I'm a partner in one. And like, it all started because I started asking these questions, you know, throughout the years, and and people were always willing to share that information. So to me, I pay it forward. I get on my, my IG and I talk about it and try to inspire people to diversify and get involved in other things. He's going to kill me, but I see another legend in here, Richelieu Dennis. Don't kill me, Rich. Just got to say, what's up? We love ya. <laughs> um, Look, I ask Rich Lou questions too. I know. I mean, Rich just should just pull up a chair. Right, well, uh, let me let me even say this about Essence though. Seriously, like I know there are a lot of women out here right now, and um, <laughs> what up, Rich? We love you. So the <laughs> thing that's so beautiful about Essence last year, I played Essence main stage, and you know they couldn't bring me back for the main stage twice, you know. But what we ended up doing was like, yeah, they they gave me one of the after parties every every night so I could do my club quarantine live after after you know after dark with Essence. And I I love that because I, I went to them and I was like, look, how do I how do we still keep the relationship going? And he has this beautiful team that actually understands that. So I now try to tell my own people that we were talking about this the other day on the phone. It's like, look, some deals, some deals aren't it just it's not black and white. Sometimes it's a little gray, and it's like, yo, you just got to go with the flow because it feels good. Like, to me, I can't, Essence Fest can't be in New Orleans, and D-Nice is not there. You know what I mean? talk, yo. You know what I'm saying, Rich? I got to be there. <laughs> All right, so uh -oh. Rich, uh -oh. Rich, Rich invited me to the Hamptons. 
But I literally got off a plane, and when we put that in the navigation, it said it was going to take three hours to get to that location. I was like, three hours? <laughs> this is the truth, Rich. This is the true story. <laughs> So I know we're going way off topic. I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to bring it back. I promise. But, all right, all right, all right. Okay. But Rich, D, D said to me, he was like, did you go to the Hamptons? I was like, nope. He said, oh, bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So getting us back, I think, well, first let me just say what my fear was today. And I don't fear much. I feared that this would be an empty room this morning. I have to speak my truth. I really did. Right? It's Monday. It's 11 a.m. A lot of us were out last night. Some of you flew in today. And I genuinely thought we were going to walk into an empty space. Um, and that brings me to why we're here today. And as you talk about kindness, being good to people, um, keeping your word, yeah. honoring your commitments, it also brings me to owning your narrative. Right, when you think of Derek, not just D-Nice, but Derek, you think of goodness, you think of a person who's always gonna show up, um, whether their camera's there or not. So for anyone in the room thinking about your own personal brand and who you are in the world, who you are in this space, who you are can, right? Let's talk about why having and owning and getting ahead of our narrative is so important as a culture and as a community and telling our own stories before others do it for us. I just never wanted to to allow other people to tell my story. Like, i give you an example. Quarantine hit, CQ blew up. I went to the next level. And by the way, I was already doing these events. Like, I was already in the White House. I was already playing Essence. I was already doing, now, did the world know? No, you had to be on that list, and you were there, and you're like, oh, d Nice is playing, it's cool. CQ blew up, every film studio, everyone came at me, and they were offering me the most incredible deals that I wanted. I was like, wow, finally, I can get this deal. One of the studios, super major studio, like big, big studio, gave me a joint venture. And I'm going to tell you why I didn't accept it. Literally, it was, we were redlining everything. And then I woke up one morning and I was like, man, this is not the way that I was supposed to tell this story. You know, I'm supposed to tell this story not right now. I'm supposed to let it age. We're supposed to get out of this feeling. So when we look back, we can see how far we came with music. And then also, no disrespect to anyone in here. It was truly black music that saved the world. You know what I mean? Like, so that's how I feel. Like, I was playing, I, I was, I mean, I love David Bowie. I was playing some Bowie, but to the core of it, I was playing Stevie Wonder. I was playing Whitney Houston, Mary J. Blige, and the world was responding to all of that. So I felt like this, why would I give this opportunity up to, why would I tell this story without involving just more people of color. You know, like this was an opportunity. No matter what happens, the story is the story, no matter who puts it out. So to me, I've always operated from a place of integrity, of always trying to do the right thing, of always looking just beyond whatever the surface is. You know, like, yeah, who, want, who wouldn't want to say you got this major deal? But at the end of the day, like to my, my spirit is like, well, what about the young kid, this, the, the young kid that needs a little bit of inspiration? Like, what am I doing for him, that young little black kid? Like, I saw a picture that my mom, my mom came into the room. My mom stays with me. You know, she saw my house, and she never wanted to leave. And I, <laughs> she literally will not leave, and I'm okay with it. I'm like, all right. But she came into the room, like, and showed me a picture of me when I was, like, seven years old. And it, I was living in Denver, Colorado, and the picture like literally broke my heart because I remember that little kid who was extremely poor, and you know, and to see what that like everything that I do is to inspire that little seven-year-old kid or some version of that kid to say like you can be who you are, and you can love your culture, and you can still resonate with everyone in the world, and that's important to me. So good, um, so good. So you said that the story is the story. I'll also say that the data is the data. 
right? Like numbers don't lie. And I think about, right, the power of being able to track and measure, right, the analytics of what we do. Um, I think about, of course, I work in tech, um, but I also have a, a music background. And you see so much happening through numbers and through data. But, and I look at all of our marketers in the room, I see folks like Mike Warner, and I see folks like just so many ad agencies, marketers, CMOs, and I just wonder, right, how much, like what's your formula and equation for following the data versus trusting your gut, right? And knowing when you have your finger on the pulse and cusp of something that's emerging that maybe the data can't track, but you know is coming. How do you decide when to trust your gut versus following the numbers? I actually feel that it should be a combination of both. Like, I don't think you should go, you know, in one direction. Trusting your gut, like, what feels good, like, that mattered. Like, and, and clearly I'm only basing this, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on everything that's happened recently. Like, so I'm going to use that, CQ. I saw the numbers rising. I saw everything. I, and I protected it. As a matter of fact, like, every record company, I'll, I'll tell you a story. When, by day two when I was doing this, I got a call. This is this part is all about trusting we your family, gut, your we're instincts. Family, we're family. I'm gonna leave brand. I'll leave the brand names out. But I got a call from a famous company that sells chicken. Right? Not chicken. No, they definitely were, they were moving a lot of chicken. They were pushing a lot of pushing chicken in these streets. A lot of <laughs> a lot of chicken weight. And they offered me a huge check. Said, yo, yo. I, Put that bag of chicken in, in your IG live. And you better like it. <laughs> you better and the check was crazy. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, the check was more than I made per gig. Now, mind you, I'm not leaving my house at this point. So it's like more than what I was earning per gig. Pre, you know, I do, I do well right now, you know, but prior to COVID. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I was like, all right, cool. You know what? Let's do it. And they, what they, the mistake that was made was they, they, they overnighted me a shirt and asked me to wear the shirt as well, right? And I was like, "Not a shirt." They, I had the chicken shirt, man. <laughs> I was like, "Man, this was about basing it on my instincts." I was like, "I cannot be D nice from Boogie Down Productions, '80s hip hop." I know I'm relevant now as a DJ, but there's still a, a percentage of people that are like, "I grew up with you." I can't wear a chicken shirt. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, that's where we draw the line. No, so that's where I, I drew the line. I was like, yo, I can't do this. Keep your check. I'm good. I'm not doing that, man. I, I didn't promote the chicken. I didn't wear the shirt. I just did what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to follow my instincts, and that's that's really what it was based on. It was like, no, I'm not supposed to do this. And, I, and, and another person that I'll say, look, we know Diddy is like the number one marketer when it comes to selling anything. Puff called me every day. Yo, put that Ciroc bottle in there. And I was like, no, I can't do it. I can't do it because it didn't feel good to me. Would I rock with Puff? I would sell anything with Puff. Like, that's the homie. Like, I'm proud of him. Like, look, whatever. But in that moment, I followed my instincts. And my instincts were, like, I wasn't supposed to do that. I was supposed to do what I did for people. And I'm glad that I followed that. Now, in terms of, like, thank you. In terms of the numbers, the numbers is act, that's actually how I knew that what I was doing was matter mattered to people. Like when people saw like it was a hundred thousand people in there, like no, actually it was like four million people. You know, Instagram just didn't have the ability to keep people logged in while you were listening to music and answering your phone. So it was literally like four million people just listening to music, and I catered my music based on those numbers. So I do pay attention to analytics. Shout out to Puff. We love you, Puff. Love you, Puff. We've been friends for a very long time. Um, so as we start to wind down, um, I wanted to touch on for a second just really the power of hip hop. It's the 50th anniversary of hip hop. You are a pioneer. Yeah. I'm going to say it again. You are a pioneer in hip hop which is the number one genre of music in the world by a long shot. Yes. 
So first, can we give it up for hip hop? Give it up for hip hop. Give it up for hip hop. Yeah, Where would we be without hip hop? I don't know. Where would honestly. you be? Hip hop saved my life, you know? Hip hop literally saved my life. I'll tell you a story. I'm full of these stories, by the way. I'll tell you a story, man, how I got into hip hop music and why I feel like everything that I do is so divine and why I try to follow like the spiritual path. I was extremely poor. I lived in like this 400 square foot apartment, this tenement apartment, fifth floor walk up. My great grandmother and I slept in the living room. It was my cousin's, my cousin's apartment. She was only 21. She had a two year old kid and she had a boyfriend that was not the father of her child and we all lived together. And that boyfriend worked at a, he worked at a men's shelter in the Bronx. Worked at the men's shelter. And he asked me if I could bring him some food. I was like 15 years old. It's like, all right, cool. I, I warmed up some corned beef hash. Remember the little Hormel corn, like Ooh. the little can? I thought I was cooking. I thought I was a chef, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I made some rice. And I walked. We didn't have Uber. And I walked to the other side of the Bronx with this, with this food. It's like three miles to get to where I was going. And I walked there. And... <clears throat> When I, when I arrived at the shelter, he said, hey, I want to introduce you to someone. And he took me into this guy's office. It was the guy who started our group, Boogie Down Productions, by the name of DJ Scott LaRock. And then Scott LaRock introduced me to a guy who lived in the shelter by the name of Karis One. So Karis lived in the shelter at that point. And I shared this story with Dave Chappelle about two years ago. And he stopped me. He was like, man, do you, do you hear what you just said? I was like, yeah, I met Scott LaRock and Karis. They was living in the shelter. He was like, no, you, you got, I got to say it like Dave's, Dave. He's like, no, man. You walk three miles with food to feed your future. That's crazy. Had I not gone there, then there is no, no D-nice in hip hop. You know what I mean? And it's like important to always follow that path, you know? So I started this conversation sharing the story of how we met when I was a law school student in North Carolina. Um, but what I didn't say was that while I was in law school at North Carolina Central University School of Law, um, which was also a university that both of my parents had attended and graduated from, I had HBCU all day, Clark Atlanta too. Um, I wanted nothing more in life than to work in hip hop. I wanted to be the next Sylvia Roan. I wanted to be the next Deborah Lee. I wanted to be the next, you name it. And I But now someone's gonna be the next you. <laughs> because of everything that you've done in this business. And when I went to New York City for the first time in my life to this random club without knowing anybody in the space for real, that was the night we met. Yep. And it was the night that I felt like my dreams were possible and were within reach and attainable. And I dropped out of law school, moved to New York City, and 20 years later became the co-president of the Grammys and now at Google. And it is such an honor and such a blessing to say that I would not be sitting here at Cannes, the 50th year of hip hop, at the Inkwell Beach stage with one of my best friends in the world, yes. if it were not for you. I love um, you. I love All you right, too. happy birthday. Let's go, y'all. Oh, we got birthday songs. On the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> happy, happy birthday to you. Oh, wow. Happy, happy birthday <laughs> to you. Go. Happy birthday to you. Derek D. Nice. <laughs> oh, wait, there's a Google K, too. <laughs> All right, I'm, like, blown away by this. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. Yeah, you can leave it here. Thank you, bro. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm enjoying it. you were special from the beginning, so here it is. Absolutely, man. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And only, Thank you, only Inkwell Beach Stage could do this. Any only last Inkwell words? Beach. No, only. And my last words, man, I'll just say leave with kindness. Shout out to Londell Mc. So Londell McMillan had me rocking at Prince's house 
for for the Prince celebration, seventh year, really, you know, since Prince has been since he transitioned, and it was so spiritual to me. And I'm looking at all this purple and all this on the screen right now, but I do want to say thank you to Londell, you know, because Legend. when I was when I was there for for another party, it didn't feel right to me, and I always wanted to be there to celebrate Prince, and you did that for me, and like. This is that's who I love, you know, and like just being kind to people. You brought me in there, and I appreciate you. Then that's then that's what we need to be. And then I'll say, I know we got to get off here, but I want to say thank you to Valicia. You know, Valicia, she shared the story on how we met. But what what's what's so beautiful about it is she's always been like protective, you know, and always gave me great advice. I'm actually a Grammy voter because of her. You know, like, she was like, why aren't you voting? I was like, no one ever asked me to. And she, the next day, you know, you, you're like, the email came. I became a Grammy voter. You know, so I, I appreciate you and everything that you've done for me and for music and just for black women in general. Like, seriously, like, you are truly an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. So let me just say to you both, thank you so much for joining this Inkwell stage. This is our fifth anniversary, and I could not want to or would not want to celebrate it in any other way with you and celebrating your birthday. Thank you for believing in us, and I'm glad everyone showed up and showed out for this panel. Um, our theme this year is Expect the Unexpected, moving from the woe is me to the wow is me as it relates to inclusion in DEI. And Derek, what you just shared with us is the wow of from adversity to where we are right now. You are the epitome of everything of how do we stay forward, focused in our thinking and continue to strive for success. So thank you so much for bringing him with me. Thank you guys. Please give Derek and Belisha D. Nice a round of applause. Happy birthday. Thank you. So you know, he's been at Inkwell and Martha's Vineyard on the CCDC stage there, and we're so humbled to have you here with us as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.